This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero safely on your iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source and you always control your own keys and seed. And by XMR.to. Anonymously exchange your Monero into Bitcoin and seamlessly send Monero to any Bitcoin address. Go to XMR.to or use it right in your Cake Wallet. Cake Wallet and XMR.to are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. This week on Monero Talk, we continue our 36C3 series. In this episode, I first speak with Alexis Roussel about his talk on protecting the digital integrity of the human person, a new legal concept that asserts if each individual is to keep their individuality, they must be protected and given effective tools to defend their own autonomy, including laws and tools for protecting individual digital integrity. Next, I speak with Gregor Zafser on his talk about the nonprofit initiative called Fair Data Society that is focused on reimagining a viable fair alternative to the current global surveillance capitalism we live in. And finally, I speak with Sergey Simonovsky of the Cyber Congress, a project that is on a mission to expose the dangers of the centralized search giant Google and provide liberating alternatives. My takeaway is Monero is only one piece of the cypherpunk initiative. We are witnessing a renaissance of liberty preserving projects and technologies. And my hope is Monero will become the backbone of this movement, providing a global frictionless flow of capital that will allow the freest society humanity can possibly imagine to blossom in the digital age. Monero Talk starts now. All right, Alexis, thanks for coming on. So uh, this morning you did, or I guess this morning for us, I don't know what time it was for you over there, you did a talk, Digital Integrity of the Human Person. How would you, uh, how would you just briefly summarize that and then we'll, I'll ask you questions about it. Yeah, so the idea is very simple. Um, you have fundamental rights and today you're right, you will have a, a very important right is the right to live and the right to live is composed of the right to have your physical and your mental integrity to be respected. Okay. And in many constitutions, you see, uh, that your physical and mental integrity of you as a person has to be protected by the state. And, uh, and actually I want to add the digital integrity to actually just acknowledge that the human person is also part of the digital space. And so where so you, you, so essentially you're looking to get uh, a new law adopted, right? Into a constant, a new, new rights uh, adopted yeah, it's, it's, into. It's, it's, that, that's, that's the end game. But the, the first game is to, to say that uh, we recognize the digital life of the human person and the digital part of the human person. And that becomes a new fundamental rights. And uh, when a new fundamental right appears, you know, um, then basically first you're going to maybe claim it in front of a tribunal and you might claim it in different places. And then eventually it will show up in the law because everyone hopefully agrees on that fundamental right. So that's, that's a bit of the process. And I want to push this in Switzerland because it's, uh, it's a good place to, to, to push it. I'm Swiss. And, uh, and we already have some work which is being done in the university and in a, in the local constitution within Switzerland. Wow. Um, so, so, but the first step is really just getting people to realize exactly. uh, that this right should exist. Exactly. So, so, um, this, uh, this is funny because it's happening in a moment where, uh, some people, People are talking about digital life. You know, if you look at, uh, online and you search for the terms digital life or vie numérique in French, people use it often, you know, oh, my, about my digital life and, and my data and me. So people actually in general have already grasped the concept that their life is not only physical or in the head, but it's also uh, their data is also part of them. Okay. So this is actually 
something that the society is already starting to accept. And uh, and I'm more about framing some the, the right words in the legal in the in the legal system, where today uh, data is only viewed as an object. Uh, some people are want to um, apply the ownership or the copyright systems on data on personal data, so you can sell it and you can uh, resell it and uh, augment it how you want it and use it as oil, you know, and people say, oh, it's the new oil of the um, uh, uh, of the world. Uh, and I want to go against that way of thinking and be more with how people feel, which is that they are owning their data, they are their d- data. So basically recognizing that this digital self, the parts that makes your digital self cannot be sold. And you... Actually, if you give you if if your data is being stored somewhere, the person the person who is hosting this data cannot become the owner of this data and is not allowed even to sell it or do whatever. So it's a different concept, but it's more it's it's like your body. You're not allowed to sell your arm or to cut yourself and uh, sell a part of your body. You know, there's some rules, and uh, and and here it's the same kind of concept I want to bring in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember. I don't know. Did you ever read the book uh, "Who Owns the Future"? Or I, I believe that was the. I, I I know of it. I didn't read it. Yeah, but yeah, he he taught he breaks it down pretty well as as well. Getting at what you're essentially getting at here is that uh, in this in this digital age where we're we're constantly um, our data is constantly being siphoned by what he calls kind of mm-hmm. these siren servers like Facebook and Google, and that uh, obviously there's value attributed. To that that data it's worth something for them and essentially uh that we should be getting paid for that the way he was yeah. uh structuring it was that we should be getting paid for for giving up that that data uh which yeah. is an interesting concept yeah. it's an it's, it's 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 there is a lot of people trying to find ways to kind of kind of get the control back on your your data you know, uh, and it's a very hard. There, there, there are many ways through. Uh, so through ownership, through getting paid, through um, uh, copyright, someone to, to want to apply copyright to data. Uh, and I just say, well, basically, actually, uh, it's a basic um, principle also in our community. If you don't, if you want to protect your data, don't give it, give out the data in the first place. You know, that's the first thing you would do. So, uh, so we need to design a society where. Where the, 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 the pure prospect of someone having data about someone else sh- should be something bad. You should not have data of someone else, you know? And then you should design your society being able to uh, exchange and to discuss and to make business with the minimal set of data which is needed um, to, to do uh, what you should do. And this is where crypto comes in because Bitcoin allows this, Monero allows this, and all the all the, the crypto economics allow this. Yeah, which is basically, I guess, what I want to ask you next. So uh, getting people to realize they have the right and then getting governments to essentially um, adopt laws that protect the right is one way of going about it. Isn't another way of going about it just creating technology such as Monero and Bitcoin, and uh, so that we don't have to ask governments for permission yeah. or accept the, or essentially yeah. uh, plead with them and ask them to give us the right, but rather just take the right and al- not yeah. allow them to take it from us. Yeah. No, absolutely, it goes it goes together. You know, the law, law is a very it's it's something which is very uh, um, uh, people think it's it's very strict. But in reality, law evolves uh, always a bit too late, but it evolves with the society. It's normally, if the law is well made, it just reflects the moral state of the society roughly at that time. So uh, if we if we if we think we need to have, uh, if the society as a whole think it's okay to uh, defend your digital self. Eventually, the right to defend your digital self and to defend your to, to be respected in your digital integrity will come up. So it's very important to build those tools because for now we're maybe a small group who think that we should do that, but eventually people will see that this group who has this power and has this uh, the group that is protecting itself right now is getting momentum in the crypto economy is also gaining being getting more and more powerful. So at one point, people will see 
that um, those people live free and with it better off than the other ones. So they will start going that direction and they will say, oh, I want also to be respected and to be uh, have use a tool that uh, I can defend myself. And this conscious of having a digital self and to be able to protect itself and to have a state, if there is still a state, and there will be for some time, but it will evolve. But at least that, as long as there is a state, that the state is respectful of also your digital self. That's important. Mm-hmm. It goes so together. Essentially, like, doing doing both. both. Yeah, yeah. That's why I'm also, you know, I in Neuchâtel, I'm also working on a crypto business, and we do both. It's the both thing that goes together. And 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 when you see crypto industry moving on it helps people to understand why it's important you know you know on basic things now now i can have a uh, if you go to see lawmakers five years ago and you say they want to make a law which allow uh, police to use a zero day exploit okay and uh, five years ago we were saying no you shouldn't do that because it's harming people and they're like no we want to catch criminals and now suddenly we can say well if you have a zero day you might endanger a whole industry with thousands of jobs around in switzerland uh, just because you have a zero day uh it's not just about um uh it's not it's not just about getting one criminal is is a whole society and a whole industry and jobs and people exchanging there and they have the life and their belongings and and suddenly, you know, then people start to think a little bit different about uh, the, the the choices of uh, using a tool like for a police officer, uh, police uh, authority to keep a zero day, you know. So uh, that's that's the kind of uh, push I'm making. It we need to do both: work on the tools so that it gets traction because those tools are good. It helps to defend ourselves, and at the same time, t- time use the right words uh, for. The, for the people, for the the rest of the society, which they are not expert in in crypto, or they're not expert in many things, but they are. They, uh, you know, I mean, you have judges. You have. We will always need all these uh, level of society that um, uh, that makes uh, the relationship between the digital space and the physical space. So we need to bring everyone together, not uh, be in our own thing where. Uh, we do our own tools and try to hope that one day the state will just pop up from there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Is this your first time at the uh, 36C3? No, no, no. no. Uh, so it's uh, every year it changes. Uh, last year was 35C3. Uh, no, uh, uh, I'm I'm here since 28C3. Yeah. Oh, okay. Or 29, 28, I think. Yeah, How has yeah. it evolved? How has it evolved since then? Has it uh, know, grown right. a lot? We, yeah, they both evolved. Uh, when I when uh, back in that time, 28 and 29, we were in Hamburg, so it was the space was much smaller, and uh, it was it felt like a spaceship, you know, uh, because suddenly you come in Hamburg in this uh, CCC and you're like uh, living in the in in your reality, which is actually the future for the rest of the world. It's really strange, and then you feel comfortable. And then we moved to Leipzig, and since three years, we moved into a building which is bigger. And now, actually, we can think it's we evolved from the spaceship. Now we're on a on a Martian base. You know, it's a there's a settlement here which uh, is much bigger, and uh, and it's taking uh, it's make yeah. Uh, you see things here which uh, uh, we hope that uh, society will organize itself like this. Uh, uh, at one point, you know, uh, all the experiments are being done here, and it's great because people are sharing them here, and uh, um, and it's very, it's a it's a great moment because it shows that there is a lot of uh, hope when when you see the world like this today. If you look at the news, you have the the main news is very dark of uh, the rise of authoritarianism and the use of this the the, the survey mass surveillance society which is build, building up and here you see hope so that's good definitely is Monero uh, a big presence there I know that they have the cluster is it is it being well yeah. received is it yeah uh, well uh, yeah I think it's uh, um, it is well received uh, I mean the the traditionally the CCC clubs they're like a bit uh, uh, they're a bit careful with everything which is money because money uh, you know, for like a European hacker, it represents the state and they don't want to deal with money. So there is this kind of story 
but since few years, we're bringing the cryptocurrency topic in here slowly, and uh, it's getting momentum. And people start to understand that it, it's actually, um, uh, you know, when you understand that the value of, of a cryptocurrency like Monero and Bitcoin is actually a sum of technologies like peer-to-peer -peer network, uh, uh, cryptography itself, um, um, uh, the blockchain. Uh, these are all technologies which all the others are working on also. You know, you want to do peer-to-peer -peer for file sharing. You want to do uh, cryptography for other something else. And... Uh, and when you put all these technologies together in a way which is unique, then it creates value. And this is something people, even inside the hacker community, had difficulty to learn. But now it's getting bigger and it's good. And I see the, the, the CDC cluster where we are since uh, uh, two years now uh, is getting traction and we have good talks. Yeah. What, so wait, what are you saying that the hesitation, though, was with the hacker community is that they... They didn't want uh, money in general, integrated the, the, into the ecosystem. The, yeah, there's there's there is a traditional. I had this too. Also, I, it took me a time to to go over to 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 go over that that bad feeling of we're going to do money with our tools, with our uh, hacker tools, with our peer to peer network. With all this, we're going to make money. Mm. And uh, and and usually uh, the community here is very. Uh, um, uh, I say it's it's a very honest community, and they uh, there there is no big lust for money in general. Okay, uh, and uh, and and often money is the, like the traditional money is seen as something that uh, we should be careful about. You know, so when when you see some of the hackers coming here and says, "Oh, we created money with uh, or something which has value with our system," there's already a, there's always a kind of like. A, at first hand, like a rejection. Okay, you you can sit the, at that table there and just be quiet in the corner. Maybe we'll see what happens. So this is what happened actually, and then it grew, and we managed to be um, to try to re remain in our area, uh, but grow um, organically and grow with good thematics. So we focus on. Uh, it's very easy. There's a lot of people working in a lot of companies and they're coming here. They want to promote their product. So we try to, um, uh, we're trying to remove that commercial aspect and to, to push out the real, uh, talks. And, and the same people are talking about the same subject. They would have done it anyway, but just not like fully commercial or whatever. You know, that's, mm -hmm. that's important too. And it creates a spirit, which is very, very important, very much needed also in the crypto community, uh, in, uh, in Europe. Definitely. I mean, I think uh, I, I love seeing Monero being a part of these type of conferences. Yeah. I think it's it's oh, it's great. It's no, a great sign it. for and uh, the community has been great support. I'm I'm really happy. I'm really 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 impressed by this. So uh, we we organize in Switzerland the kind of loose group, which is called the Swiss Crypto Economics, and we we hook up with Monero team and Ria team to uh, to help a bit there. So. Uh, um, I made sure that like, some some of my friends and people come uh, in uh, from the crypto industry come in in here, uh, but uh, the Monero team has been great in organizing the set, which is fantastic. I mean, yeah, and also the I know there was some some financial support from the community, so thank you guys for for helping. That it's great. All right, where could uh, people learn more about what you're working on about the digital integrity? Project. Okay, so we have a website. It's called. Uh, it's in French, but there is a little bit of uh, English material. So it's in French because I'm focusing now on the Swiss uh, level, you know. And uh, there's also like some uh, university work and political work being done in Switzerland. So it's very much in French and a bit in German. Uh, it's called vinumerique.ch. So v i e uh, numerique n u m e r i q e e dot c h. It means digital life, but in French. And, uh, and there you have a couple of resources uh, to learn about this, uh, this topic. All right. We'll get the links from you as well. We'll add them in the show notes. Okay. Perfect. All right. All right thanks for coming on. I hope you enjoy the conference. And Thank uh, yes. thanks for all your work. We're in the middle of it. So, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, okay. man. Great talking. Bye-bye. Cheers. All right, Gregor. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. Thank so, you. So, what is the uh, the Fair Data Society? What 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 exactly is that? 
So uh, right now, right now it's uh, an initiative. It's uh, a couple of projects coming together. Uh, it's an initiative regarding, I would say, in the main sense, it's about freedom. But if we go into more specific, it's an initiative to create a self sovereign data commons. And if we take the definition of what commons is, commons is a social living system where people address a shared problem in a self-organized way. So, you know, if we apply this now to the data economy into which we live now, it's definitely not self-organized uh, in this sense. It's being con uh, driven and controlled by a handful of entities. Um, and uh, I would say that we as the people, uh, we do share this problem. So, uh, and the problem, the problem pertains, uh, what we also describe, it's like, um, we don't see just the problem surveillance capitalism itself. Problem is also how the product design is happening with the uh, uh, dopamine economy being the driver. So if we combine these two powerful forces, we actually come to something that's getting referred to as data slavery, where we actually, our freedom, our freedom of mind is at stake uh, for the price of driving profits for some corporations. So in this sense, Fair Data Society uh, wants to be also the glue between the tech and the social, because it's not just about developing the tech, it's also how do we use this tech to design systems that are fair. Mm. And um, maybe just a side note, what is fair data? Uh, you could think of it as digital fair trade. So fair trade in its essence, it's about protecting the individual, their rights. It's about fair distribution of value and uh, against exploitation. And uh, we don't really have anything like this yet in the digital domain. And uh, we are being exploited as the users. You know, our rights and privacy are being constantly violated. So uh, we see uh, fair data society or and fair data economy within the society as an alternative path how we can reimagine the whole data economy so that it's inclusive and the values distributed in a fair way so what is the fair data society doing to kind of implement these ideas yeah um so uh there are a couple of uh tracks uh, of our activities uh as i said uh we want to be the glue between the social and the tech. So uh, the starting point uh, are so-called Fair Data Society principles. These principles are, uh, it's a set of guidelines around which the ecosystem can converge, around which we can coordinate uh, the development of the whole uh, data economy. Um, this is also uh, this implies also shared values, uh, which we see in other networks and ecosystems that there may be a clear lack of these values uh, creates then uh, down the road tensions within the ecosystem and less coherent solutions. So that's that's one side. But uh, at the same side, uh, time we want to be hands on. So we released an app called FairDrop. This is uh, like we transfer, but it's completely decentralized. It's uh, encryption by default. So it enables people to securely send files to other people, larger, larger files, without being censored, surveilled, or stopped in any kind of way. Why we did this? It's a basic use case, but also because we believe that in the digital age, uh, sending files in a free way it's kind of like a prerequisite. It could be considered a human right. Everybody should be able to send something to somebody else. Um, and we didn't just release uh, the app itself. Uh, while doing the app, uh, we also created a Fair Data Society library with which we build the app. And this library, this, uh, this is the start that enables other developers to easily build so-called zero data apps apps that don't leak data, uh, that are not driven by this data accumulation and that protect the privacy of the user. Uh, next step, what we are now doing is also a call. We started already a uh, call to the ecosystem. Uh, it's an application called Fair Drive. And uh, this one, we, 
it's an evolution compared to Pedrop, and as the name maybe already implies, it's like Google Drive or Dropbox or any kind of these uh, storing solutions. But again, with a major difference that it's about self-sovereign data stored in decentralized storage, where we can say, you know, your keys, your data. We can we can apply the same kind of mindset that we see in the blockchain space when we speak about uh, coins or tokens or cryptocurrencies. And moreover, this is it's not just the difference in the technology stack; it changes the relationships because. This enables other apps to easily save the data and read the data from this uh, space, from the user's fair drive. And this, in return, you know, it's like imagine, imagine if today you would have all the data from the apps that you use in a single space. What kind of other data, other data you could generate, what kind of analytics, what kind of new apps, you know, combining this data? with all these different data streams. And what and if this is done locally, client side, without leaking data, you can also be relaxed in using a lot more sensitive data. Let's think about future, like brainwave data, uh, DNA data, you know, like affective emotional data, like very sensitive data that could be considered Cambridge Analytica porn. Mm. We don't want to give that data away mm-hmm. because it's about our freedom, not, mm-hmm. not anything else. So, but with Fair Drive, there is also another thing. Uh, Fair Drive can only be successful if we, as the whole ecosystem, recognize that we need to join forces. It's free software. It's an initiative, you know, to create these commons that it's everybody uh, takes part of it uh, who is part of the digital world. Mm-hmm. Now, now the software is it's it's free software, but what what's funding funding the operation? I mean, uh, especially the storage aspects. Oh, that's a that's a very good question. So, uh, I would say first and foremost, uh, a lot of enthusiasm and uh, a strong uh, sense of mission to achieve. You know, so uh, and this is basically the prerequisite for. Uh, driving also the fundraising processes. So uh, we partially uh, funded ourselves. Uh, we look for uh, donations. We are we are driving different campaigns. We apply to grant calls. So it's however we can do it uh, without compromising uh, the integrity of the project, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is yeah. Uh, for example, Fair Drive campaign. Uh, it is published also on the giveit.io. Uh, it's one of uh, uh, it's a solution uh, for charities and uh, non-profits uh, running on Ethereum, uh, and uh, we also use it because it allows us to basically deal with donated funds in a transparent and accountable way. It's clear where something goes for what kind of development. This is also it's. Uh, this is also laying the initial seeds. Uh, we are about, uh, in January, we will uh, release a white paper about the Fair Data Society DAO. And there are like a couple of, I think now it would be maybe out of the scope to go into it, but there are also basically laid out guidelines how to take it to the next level of decentralized governance and decentralized development with proper incentives. So that it's kind of self-sustainable and it can evolve through time. Hmm. Now, do you work on cri- like cryptocurrency projects as well? Are you a developer for for any cryptocurrencies as well? Um, not directly, not directly in terms of cryptocurrency. Uh, we are actually uh, Fair Data Society wants to be blockchain agnostic. We are uh, our solutions are now based on Ethereum. It's uh, but long term uh, goal is uh, to be present anywhere. We believe, you know, in a sense that. If I want to deal with my data, I should uh, that shouldn't be constrained by the which blockchain I use, because uh, this this system, decentralized storage, are very complementary with all kinds of blockchains. So depending on the use case, on the preferences of the user, the user should be able to choose which kind of blockchain uh, they use as a complement. Mm-hmm. In essence, why? Because our designs also aim to do most of the things off-chain. So 
In this sense, we use blockchain in the blockchain as a judge paradigm, mostly for withdrawals, deposit, conflict, dispute, and things like that. Mm -hmm. As a notary services, in essence, yeah. Okay. How did you uh, link up with the, the Monero uh, cluster? Uh, it's, um, this is uh, through uh, common friends. It's through Riot. So, okay. uh, I used to, I used to live in Vienna, you know, uh, and, uh, with, uh, the Riot team, uh, we've been friends, uh, whew, since very long, you know, so, uh, and Riot, uh, basically Riot onboarded me to Monero. So, okay. Yeah. Are you, uh, are you a Monero enthusiast as well? In addition to. Yes. 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 Okay. I like, uh, I like Monero a lot. It's, uh. And uh, one of the things that I like, I'm not, I'm not really a developer, a deep technical guy, so I cannot comment on the low level code, so to say, but uh, I think Monero has an outstanding community in terms of uh, the people that I meet in Monero, the, the drive, when you see like people working on Monero, it's, uh, it's pure, you know, I, I don't know, uh, maybe, yeah. Maybe that's that's the best word I can I can find now, and I believe I believe this this is also in in a sense uh, serves uh, as one of the inspirations for what we are trying to do with Fair Data Society and why we started with the principles. It's how how to create these pure communities and ecosystems that agree on the vision of what we are building and that actually we can only build it together. Mm -hmm. And this. This I feel a lot in the Monero community, and I like it a lot. Yes. Yeah, we were. I was just talking to. I don't know if you know Ome. Uh, he gave yes. a talk yes. earlier today yeah. on yeah. Uh, the forks, and we were talking about how in Monero uh, the community seems to be more cohesive, and because of that, there are less contentious forks. Everybody seems to be uh, aligned uh, and trying to move in the same direction in Monero. Yes. 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 Yeah. I think I think a lot of other uh, projects uh, in this space could learn from Monero. Yeah. Very cool. So, is this your first uh, conference? C three no, conference? No, uh, it's uh, it's my third time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, every time at the CDC, yeah, at the critical decentralization cluster. Yeah. Very yeah. cool. Yeah. All right. I think uh, we'll, we'll we'll keep it short. We're gonna have a few more people on today. Uh -huh. And yeah. uh, thank you very much. Yeah, we'll yeah, we'll, uh, we'll add your your talk to the show notes so people yeah, could watch yeah, your full yeah, talk from today. Yeah. Awesome. All I'd right. be you know maybe uh, maybe one more thing. I don't know. Uh, so next month when we are we are uh, releasing the white paper, this is this is actually this is also going it's going to be a white paper draft. We don't want to finalize it actually, but. Uh, this is the moment when we would also like to reach uh, to the other communities because it presents the vision in a more holistic way so so people can easier decide for themselves if they resonate with it or not. And it would be great uh, to somehow share this with the Monero community. Okay. Uh, so I don't know, maybe uh, when you have the link up or uh, maybe we can then at later stage also update it with a link to the white paper for Fair Data Society or something. Yeah, yeah, Do you definitely. Think that would be possible? Of course. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Great. All right. Thank it was you nice very to meet you. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. It was nice meeting you. Yeah. All right, Serge. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. So you're with the Cyber Congress Project. Yeah, that's correct. That's it. That's right. That's correct. What? It, how would you quickly uh, summarize or define that for anybody who's watching? I love that question because there's no quicker way of doing it. <laughs> well, what I would say is that we're, what we're doing is an open source uh, machine that is able to provide and prove relevance between two objects at any point of time, at any, for any two people. So that's very, very quickly. The other way is would be to say that we are creating a search protocol and a machine for answers. So that's like the really quick. So kind of like a, a decentralized Google, is that? Yes, that is spot on. That is spot on. I mean, we like to, I'm not sure how do you take swearing on the show. So I hope you're okay with it. No, if not, we, tell we, me. We don't censor <laughs> here, so. 
yeah, that's that's excellent. Uh, so yeah, so our motto is to fuck Google. It doesn't mean we hate Google. You have to be genius in order to enslave seven billion people over the past twenty years without them understanding them to enslave them. So we think that Google is genius. And in fact, the ranking algorithm that we use, for example, I think I'm jumping a little bit ahead of myself, but we we, we do take some things from Google. So yeah. How far along is this project? Okay, cool. Uh, well, we've been doing it for the past three years. Everything is obviously open source. In fact, we don't do anything that is not open source, like nothing at all. Uh, right now, uh, last week, we have launched our hopefully last public incentivized testnet. Uh, we actually did it live. There's some YouTube videos. I mean, they're, they're a bit of raw footage, but we'll, we'll get them ready to... But anyways, yes. Yeah, so hopefully... Uh, with that testnet, we have some distribution games, uh, some technical distribution games, and hopefully within about three, between three and five months, it will come to an end, and we'll be able to launch the mainnet, but we have certain things, certain goals that we set for ourselves. For example, we set ourselves a goal that we want 146 validators to be in consensus before the mainnet, for the launch of the mainnet. So, for example, that's one goal. So our idea is to not just to launch the mainnet raw, but to launch it in a decentralized state. Mm. In your talk, you talked about um, Web 3.0, which I guess is where what we're approaching, right? How would, how would you define Web 3.0? It's a great question. Um, we love to call it the Great Web, I think, just because we kind of want to show off a little bit because we want to be different. No, I'm kidding. But uh, no, we, we like that name better. The reason we like it better because, well, web, the, web, just saying web and a number doesn't really give the whole stash an effect, I guess. And to me personally, the way I define Web3 is a fair and ability to communicate between nodes, between robots, between humans, between any kind of intelligent species that can prove to one another the existence of a private key in terms of cryptography and obviously they will be motivated for it so the difference between web 2 well sorry not the difference but web 2 is where we have a lot of different entities that aren't really well there is the people who create the content there are people who take use the content there are people who provide serves services people who provide infrastructure in web 3 all of those all of those entities kind of get deleted and they kind of get minged into one big thing so yeah, so that's kind of Web3. It's a kind of a much fairer way to communicate. It's a motivated way to communicate. And yeah, that's pretty much it. And direct, obviously, sorry, the, the most important thing, obviously there's no black box intermediary in Web3. Well, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, like you say, hopefully. So do you, do you think, what, what do you think the trajectory is? I mean, do you think we'll succeed at kind of winning back the internet for the people here? Well, well for one, obviously, we believe in it, and this is what we do. And our idea is to to fight that fight till the end. We believe it is a fight. It is why it is a fight because people underestimate how deep the essence of our privacy that was was stolen. How 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 long ago, and how deep we are living into that fake communication protocol that is Web two has created. And this is a big problem because, I mean, if you look at Cambridge Analytica, right, and uh, I'm sure you know about the case and, you know, everything that, they, that they've done, let's not mention actual cases, but everybody who wants to find that out, it's not a big problem. And there's just one example of how how deceiving that thing is. And when I say hopefully, it's because obviously there are other entities like the megacorps and the government that obviously they realize that that game is on. And I'm sure that they are trying to play that game, even though we don't we don't hear about it, because obviously they are not open source about it. But I'm sure they are playing that game, and hopefully we we can do something about it. And that that's our goal. Um, do you, I feel like we're kind of at the same crossroads that we were at in the early days of the internet when you read about the history of the internet? Um, there were decisions that were made that could have kind of taken us into the more ideal direction where where kind of privacy and things would have been built into those protocols. And I feel like we're at that crossroads now, um, especially with things like cryptocurrency. So where you see projects like Bitcoin that don't have uh, privacy fungibility built into the protocol level, but you have things like Monero that do, and then trying to fight to get make one of those protocol be, be the one that ultimately gets adopted by society. 
Uh, do you look at things that way? Do you have a similar? 100%, 100%. I think that, well, if you, but this is, this is why we share the same values and this is why we all kind of get interconnected at the end of the day. Um, and I'm absolutely like 100% on what you said there that we are back at square one pretty much. The thing is, I don't think that everything that we're doing here, including Bitcoin, Monero, and Cyber Congress, we're not really invented, you know, something amazing. What we did is we combined the technologies that already existed in the right architectural structure with the ability infrastructure that is available to every single human being out there right now, which wasn't available 20 years ago. For example, you know, obviously we're talking about in terms of... Um, the, the computational power, right? Like 20 years ago, obviously, the people didn't, couldn't even imagine having that computational power that they have in the in phone. I'm not saying a phone is a good thing because it's a tracking device, but, you know, I think we're on the same line. So absolutely spot on that we're back to square one and now it's either we're going to try and take it the right way or we're going to go again into what I call Web 4. I mean, I know that some other people talk about Web 4 maybe differently. To me, Web 4 is some kind of a scary cyberpunk automated gearbox where everything is happening automatically but nobody has the power to control it so like kind of a black well what's that um series called is it's uh, a black, black mirror right black mirror where, yeah yeah where, you know they already don't have the, they lost the control and to me web 4 is where the mega corps win and they have maybe maybe not i mean this is just something that's maybe i'm making this up as i go but um hopefully those crossroads like you say you know, projects like Bitcoin, like Monero, like Cyber Congress, like Cosmos, like IPFS, they will help people to to open their minds, think outside the box and see that there are other possibilities. Yeah. My concern is, though, that like something like Bitcoin is um, sold as being a potential solution, but it might actually be the opposite because now you have everybody opting on to this transparent um, ledger. Uh, that could ease, very easily be surveilled by anybody with with the resources to do so. Do you have any concerns with that? Well, luckily for everybody, we have things like Monero that solve those things. And you know, this is um, there are other options. I'm not, you know, everybody's free to investigate them and research them. But I think Monero here being, you know, one of probably the biggest player. I mean, we can all agree on that. You know, and the market. This kind of already already shows that, right? And yeah, I agree with you that Bitcoin has a lot of well, what's the right word? So I'm not sure if I should use the word box here, right? But uh, maybe back, but it's not backdoors, obviously, right? But anyways, it has its downsides and it has its upsides. But to me personally, decentralization is about look, anarchy. It's about freedom of choice. It's about free will and freedom of choice, and about the person being able to stand on those crossroads, like you're saying, have a look and say, okay, I have coin A, coin B, I have Monero. So what will I choose? It's my choice. I make the choice. I can see all the minus and the pluses on the cons and the pros. And I will make that choice because I know this is better for me. And this is the beauty of decentralization for me. And and yeah, so I obviously, yeah, <laughs> something like that. So do you think the success of uh, this more private Web 3.0 is inevitable or there's uh, a good chance that we that we fail? I wouldn't be here if I thought we failed because then it's kind of I would say that my life was pointless. I, mean, <laughs> <we'd> be, <laughs> yeah, I guess I guess my, my question is, <laughs> what, what do we need to do to make sure we don't fail? I mean, what, what needs to be done if you... You know what? You know, ironically, ironically, the, the thing that I would say probably the, the first thing that I would say that has to be done by each person out there is educate yourself, open your mind up, and don't. I mean, I'm right now at this one of the probably the most amazing like conferences in the world right now with CCC and in Leipzig, right? Uh, if somebody who doesn't know is a big like hacker congress and it, it's it's cool it's like you know over 15,000 people and they're all crazy and it's amazing and adventurous and it's amazing but anyways but even here I meet people who are not ready to to, to make that little push outside the box and sometimes you, you know you're speaking to a person and you're like oh this guy is sharing my views and it's so amazing and 
I can feel like together we can like change the world. And then suddenly he, he brings this. And, and it's not the problem of the per- person. The person is, is completely great. You know, I would love to, to, to get more into his brain. But when I say educate yourself, it's open your mind up. You know, there are so many things out there that are still un- uninvestigated and still, you know, we're still to learn like, like human, like, like species that, you know, it, it, not just technologically. But but econom- economically, and this is one great thing crypto has done. It has opened us the mind. It opens the mind for a person to understand that the current economical system is completely fucked up. Well, there's actually nothing behind it. And if anybody goes out there and reads John Law, which is like a 16th century book that put the fiat, uh, that well said the beginning to the fiat system to the current fiat system, he will realize that there is nothing that beckoning. But okay, I'm kind of going off track. But yeah, so so basically, what I'm saying is education, education, and meant more education, and in, in in all kind of technologically, sociologically, psychologically, every kind of way that we can go about education. I think is the way forward to to beat the system. What cryptos are 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 you into? Are there are there lots of different ones? Is this one or two? Um, um. Kind of, I don't like stigmas, but but I guess I guess if you I was gonna like stamp myself with a stigma, I would say that I'm probably crypto maximalist. I'm not sure what it means, but that means that I like a lot of projects. Uh, well, Monero is one of them. Uh, we actually have uh, Monero nodes, full Monero nodes running like locally, not not in the cloud, uh, and I think that's amazing. I think everybody should do that. Um, Obviously, I like Bitcoin. I still think it's a, it's an interesting project. That is, it's a good project in my opinion. It's a good store of value. Let's let's, let's keep it at that. Uh, Cosmos. Um, I'm quite excited for Polkadot. Seeing how well that will go. Obviously, we still have to wait. I'm excited about Filecoin. Um, so obviously about my own project. But <laughs> you know, this is you know uh, kind of obvious. So yeah. So m- m- mostly, I'm interested in the projects that are either trying to solve scalability issues and really have the code back in those words like Polkadot and Cosmos or well Filecoin in terms of storage or projects like Monero and Bitcoin that are actually you know actual monetary values and they are solving certain problems whether with Bitcoin it's store of value or with Monero it's their privacy issue and the ability to actually transact with a coin rather than just storing it mm-hmm. so yeah uh, the the Decentralized Google. Are there are there other pe- projects, other people trying to achieve the same thing? I think a lot of people say that they do, and I'm not trying to, you know, say that we're the only project in the world to try. And I mean, the other like um, week, I think it was a few weeks ago, I put a big Alify fuck on our GitHub, uh, and one of the my my idea was like a hundred questions, it's like a lot of different things. And one of the things I was trying to answer myself because I did have that question whether there are other people who are trying to solve that, obviously. And I think that's great. And in fact, you know, we we are happy for people to come in and forking us out and doing it better than we can if they can do that. Excuse me. But um, I just think that if you are trying to go have a stab at it, you have to understand that it's a very broad kind of scope of things, which sounds like search is very simple, but it's not. It actually leads to to, to whole, whole, it, it raises up everything. It raises up search is basically the essence I mean, right now, Google is the biggest religion in the world. When you want to find out about something, you blindly believe Google to whatever information you get. You believe them, and that, that's why it's a religion. More so, Google is your father. Google is your is your source of knowledge. We learn from Google. We don't question it. We, 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 un- we believe in it blindly, knowing that it's not true, knowing that the ranking mechanism and the whole hyperlink thing is broken right and so so when somebody says we're trying to build a decentralized google i wouldn't just trust their words like i wouldn't trust my words i would go and have a look at the actual code have a look if they actually have something to back it up with and i hope that that, that's we do well we actually do (laughs) it does work the system works and um, we're really happy that it works so hopefully it will push on forward with time how do you see adoption taking place? Um, what do you see as being the <sighs> motivation for people to move over to this new way of searching? You know, there is. That's that's. Uh, I, I like your questions. They're the the, the the very simple but difficult questions. <laughs> but um, yeah. Uh, well, there are a few answers to that. One would be 
that right now it's obviously the infrastructure stage. And we are concentrated on releasing the network stable, efficient, decentralized, and so on with the best distribution that we can achieve and so on and so forth. Um, obviously, there will be an adoption stage. And for us, we actually uh, have a target audience. We believe that anybody who's under 18, I'm not saying that everybody else shouldn't use that. In fact, everybody who uses the internet is our target audience. But the reason I say people under 18 is because I think that the generation has already understands what a digital self means and how important that is. And I think that mass adoption with them will be much easier and it will come at a much easier rate. I'm not saying we're going to like ignore everybody else. No, 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 no way. Like we obviously understand that uh, everything is important, but I think that mass adoption will come when the younger generation will start to use that. And, and that, that's, that's where it will come. Where can uh, people learn more about it? Well, obviously GitHub, uh, our GitHub is Cyber Congress. Obviously they can, and from there you can find loads of links like to our website which is uh, cybercongress.ai. Uh, there isn't actually much information on our website because the website is more about the DAOs, but there are loads of links to our, like, uh, the, uh, the wiki, the forum, the blog, um, and GitHub is the main, our, like, main point where the white paper is kept and all the links to all of our forums, blogs, and so on and so on. So it's github slash cyber congress and i'm sure everybody can find the information from there all oh, right or or there is like a testing well it's a very alpha testing uh, from that we did it's cyber dot page so it's like the search box with all the um, small little things but it's it's a very alpha thing so yeah but if somebody wants to, to test it they can test it yeah <laughs> All right, we'll we'll, uh, we'll get the links from you. We'll add them in the show notes yes, if, you, yes, if you don't mind. Sure, All right, sure, great. Sure, sure. All right, well, th thanks for coming on. Really appreciate it. Yeah, Hope you uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. All right. Okay. Thanks, man. Bye. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.